This audio is for educational purposes only. I hope this will add light to your journey. Please share this audio to your loved ones, family and friends. Thank you. Art of Selfishness, Chapter 10, A New Golden Rule. Jasper Judson closed his eyes, as if to shut some painful picture from his memory. He was a wizened little man, whose nervous hands picked at the upholstery, weariness, and despair brooded in his voice. Frank was always my favorite, he said at last, and I did everything for him. I'd not had many opportunities when I was a boy, but I certainly gave them to him. What did you do for him? I asked, certain of what I would hear. Judson seemed hardly to hear my question. I'd grown in a mill town and had to work part-time. When I was six, I got some schooling, but after I was twelve, mother needed all I could earn. It wasn't so bad. I liked work, but I wanted to study, too. I used to sit at my books till long after midnight. That's how I got on. Work days, learned nights. When did you play? My voice was low to diminish an explosive response. Play, my attempt to soften the discharge had done good. Play, he repeated. I didn't play. So, you wanted to give Frank a chance to do so? I queried, as if the idea was most obvious. No, he shouted. No, I gave him the things I'd missed. When he was three, I got him a nurse. She was a good woman. Grew up to the north of here and had an exemplary father. She taught him his letters. Was she yellow? I demanded unexpectedly. Yellow, yes, shrunken and yellow, wrinkled, thin-lipped, pale gray eyes, iron gray hair, sort of, sharp nose, long, thin hands, spoke precisely. Did you know her? He asked incredulously. Yes, I mused. I knew fifty-seven of her. She was good at grammar and arithmetic. Splendid, he agreed with enthusiasm and had a good idea of discipline. Say, she could have run an army. His ardor was mounting. Why did you give her up? I didn't. She became our housekeeper. We lived a good, sparse life. Miss Flint used to read to Frank. From the time he was four, I selected his books most carefully. He had the best clothes, nice white collars, and the prettiest little hats. She bought them, said. She'd never had nice, lacy things herself, and it was a pleasure to see how she could dress him up. In the summer, she took him on long walks, and sometimes went to the city to see the museums. I sent him to a military academy. When he was twelve, what did he do summers? I took him into my plant, so he could get the discipline. Works the best thing for a boy, but I didn't want him to struggle, as I did, so I put him in the charge of my best foreman. Macintosh could teach anyone. He could. I see. You practice the golden rule. From start to finish. Doing unto Frank. As you would be done by. I certainly did. I'm sure of it. I agreed. With sudden emphasis. And now. You tell me. He's gone wild. My companion's face changed. His eyes narrowed. He's been drinking. He's run off. With a lewd woman. And. He's in. With that Greenwich Village gang. Unfortunately, my partner, Thompson, always loved the boy, left him a bit of money, and he's going through it, like water, late nights, dances, theaters, yes, he would, of course, I mused quietly, but he's not a bad fellow, not bad, how do you know, you asked me to see him when you wrote to me, and you did, I nodded, he's quite different from his father. How did you expect him to like the things you liked? I obeyed the golden. Oh yes, yes, I interrupted. That maddest, saddest, most terrible rule, as millions interpret it, that maker of hell on earth, as they used it to justify their egotism. I passed him a book, as I spoke, a treatise on the old masters, full of reproductions and stories of their love escapades. What's this for? He puzzled, thumbing the pages. It's a fascinating record of the artists. I thought, you might like to borrow it. 
and this book of modern plays, an omnibus, you know, all the best things the guild done, I haven't time, for such nonsense, he growled, no, now, I adore it, I thought, you'd want to read it, say, what are you driving at, trying to show you, that your boy has gone wild, because of the golden rule, you have done unto him, as were done by, I was offering to you and you, these books, doing as I'd been done by, you hate them, your boy hated everything, you did for him, the golden rule, is brass, or, base lead, no, not even lead, you say that, surely, I do, it sends boys, and girls, to the dogs, it's not millions there, anything that does that, is worse than lead, lead has some use, the golden rule, in your hands, is a grim jail of iron bars, a very convenient means, of dominating others, and, of working your will upon them, there never, was anything more evil, than that, what would you substitute, he asked, too shocked to protest, how should I have treated my boy, as a first step, you might learn to do unto others, as they would be done by, or, as you, if you had their natures, would be done by, that isn't enough, but, it's a start, Frank wanted to waste his time, playing a fiddle, that's what he's doing now, I nodded, earns his living playing the violin, in a dance orchestra, well, the inflection in Judson's voice, held the horror, that a Barrymore might have put into it, but, I ignored the implication, your boy, Mr. Judson, is musical, artistic, creative, he inherits from his mother's family, his mind is imaginative, and singularly human, he knows instinctively, how people do things, and why, he's a fine mimic, of voice, face, and, manners, practically, everything you did for him, was wasted, because, it was built on the pattern, of your nature, not his, your nerves, make you a plodder, in an unemotional routine life, Frank, is sensitive, and subjective, his glands intoxicate him, with feeling and enthusiasm, as a child, he needed a chance, to express himself constructively, lots of music, and color, good dramas to see, adventure stories to read, boys to play with, he lacked everything necessary, for his growth, I've given him an introduction, to a theater man, a producer, he's had a tryout, and been given a small part, he'll be a success, to earn more money in the movies, than ever you've made, Mr. Judson sat fascinated, as if, some sea serpent had teared its head, out of the ocean, there, I was justifying a boy, and, quietly, condemning the father's life effort, in handling him, after the good old golden rule, taking advantage of the silence, I continued, I've seen Frank several times, he's dropped the drinking, and the wild woman, he wants to succeed, now, he understands how, and, he hasn't any guilt, about going contrary to your desires, he has no need, to show his independence, by riotous living, you were the cause, of his delinquencies, but, he's too sorry for you now, to want to hurt you, sorry for me, yes, he sees all you've lost, what you've been deprived of, all these years, he'd like to help you, have some of the things he's missed, devotion and tenderness, you know, those rare moments of companionship, when two people sit together, before a fire, each understanding the other, and loving the difference, in their personalities, you've never had, the beautiful things in intimacy, he'd like to give them to you someday, I hadn't time, Mr. Judson's voice was husky, no, you hadn't time, you worked so hard, you came home as empty, as a worn out packing case, there isn't any greater selfishness, I guess, than the sort of unselfishness, that works and works, to give a family money, and deprives it of everything else, in the last analysis, had Jasper Judson believed, in the law of integrity, never compromise yourself, he would not have attempted, to impose his own will, upon his son, had he believed with equal ardor, in the magic formula, and, permitted himself, no ego satisfactions, he would not have used his own whims, as the basis for his pseudo-unselfishness, 
nor would father and son have lived as halfway men, constricted by ethical ignorance. I have examined thousands of human beings during years of clinical psychology. In my experience, the greatest single case of moral delinquency is the golden rule in the hands of rigidly good people to transfer to others the abnormal wants that control your life, assuming that what you think is good for you will be good for them is hardly kindness. I had a relative who tried that on me. In my youth, she believed every fad, from strange foods to weirder faiths. When with her, my life, for my own good, was restricted to that of a mad Hindu, eating nuts on the rooftop of a Tibetan monastery. I was a victim of the golden rule. One can't even fully apply this doctrine in terms of doing unto others as they would be done by, or as you, if you were in their fix, would be done by. I know a man who wanted to die, but was afraid to take his life. He asked his pal to kill him. The friend would certainly have wanted to die had he had the same suffering. Later on, the man came out of his sadness and was glad to be alive. The desire was a mood, deeply seen. The new golden rule should read, do unto others, as life, nature, and cosmic law would have you do, follow, as truly as you can, your understanding of that law, and go after every scientific means available, to gain more insight. If you can't do this, at least, change the old saying, to include, the other person's nature, in view of modern knowledge. The rigid application of unselfishness, which the old wording permitted, was evil. Indeed, if you treat your wife as you would be done by, you won't consider very wisely her opposite sexual organism. You'll trespass constantly on her personal preferences. If you are a woman and treat your husband on the basis of feminine values, you'll understand little of his masculine needs and tendencies. When I was a child, the women in my home kept me in long curls, starched white dresses, pink ribbons, bright buckled shoes, and velvet banded, delicate straw hats. They punished me when I climbed fences, shinned up posts, got out on roofs, chased cats, wandered in swamps, raced through thickets, and shrieked when my tangled hairs were combed. They loved white dresses, lace collars, fancy shoes. I was treated by the golden rule. Now, I admit, I couldn't wisely have been treated, as I would have been done by, or, as they would have been by, had they been sturdy, self-reliant, and defiant small boys, I'd have liked, to have looked like a Samoan Islander, I'd have acted, like the son of a Fiji, I'd never sat quietly, and eaten my porridge, with stately grace, but, wasn't it worse, to put a little lad, in the trimmings of a Victorian woman, with her timidity and frills, than to let him go nude, and grow strong and natural. His way, that is, my way, was far, the wiser of the two. Best of all, would have been to do, unto a small boy, according to his basic needs, according to cosmic law, according to ways of health and sanity, if they had borne in mind, how, I as a man, in his fifties, would have liked to been treated as a boy, they would, at least, have let me be manly, in apparel, as well as in behavior.